So Alex, why are you so into Pinot? It's like <laughs> kind of a thing with you. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a hard grape to grow, you know, it's, it's thin skinned, it, it, it ripens early, as you know. It's, it's not a survivor like Cabernet, which grows anywhere and can thrive even when neglected. No, Pinot needs constant attention and, and it can only grow in specific little tucked away corners of the world and only the most patient and nurturing of growers can, and can tap into Pinot's fragile, delicate qualities. Only when someone has taken the time to truly understand it can it be coaxed into its fullest expression. And when that happens, oh, oh its flavours are just the most haunting and brilliant and subtle and ancient on the planet. And my father took me to Claude de Vougeot when I was 13 and let me try some Grand Cru and I was ruined for the rest of my life. Tonight on the Online Wine Tasting Club, to avoid talking about badgers, we decide to discuss sheep instead. We try to talk about clones without getting Jamie wittering on about Spider-Man or Darth Vader. And unfortunately, Caroline isn't in the studio to present her wine choice. It's time to dig into the noblest family of grapes with the adventurous series, Pinot Masterclass. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you. Um, goodness me, we just had a bit of a tight one, didn't we? Uh, well, anyway, we're here and we're live and we're not too late and that's wonderful. It is lovely to see you all and um, welcome to the Online Tasting Club. For those who haven't been here before, um, it, this is a different sort of wine tasting, isn't it? It is, um, because it's Pinot and Pinot and Pinot and then after those first three Pinots, we're probably right. going to do... Three more Pinots. I think we might be, but it is kind of in the name. So, so yeah, we, we just thought this is a, uh, you know, there are fewer grape families out there. You know, there's the Cabernet family, there's the, the Sauvignon family, there's the, the Merlot family. These the, are all The Adams different. family? The Adams family, indeed. Um, no? Okay. But, um, yeah, the, of all of these different families, the most complex and the most highly regarded uh, by a lot of people is the Pinot you. family. Highly regarded by you. It, well, by by me indeed, as as as, and also uh, I I haven't put in the credits, but apologies to anyone involved with the film Sideways, from whom we shamelessly stole that uh, opening sequence. But, oh, I thought that was all yours. Uh, well, of course, I would love to claim to be uh, such a, a wordsmith, but um, yeah, we are going to. Uh, why don't we get wine number one into the glass? Because we're first of all we're going to start off with a Pinot Blanc. So before we dive into this video very quickly, I just want to confirm with you that we're doing six wines that DNA-wise are identical. Pretty much, pretty much, apart from tiny little mutations. Okay, yes. so six wines that are the same. Almost certainly. That yet, sounds like a very interesting it tasting. It does sound a bit boring, doesn't it? But anyway, should we um, let you do your, your usual yeah, yabbering we... on about wine and clones and this? Um, <laughs> um, so we'll get, the, we'll get the Poly V up so you guys oh, can yeah, start. Um, uh, dive in and um, get your tasting notes in um, because you know what you're tasting, and yeah, we will get indeed. back to that. And um, we'll then go into our little Pinot video, come back, talk a bit about this Pinot Blanc from uh, Doff, but enjoy. Oh, absolutely, and, uh, go we thought we'd just tell a bit about the history and about the differences between these different grapes. So uh, enjoy the video and come back to us very soon. Pinot means different things in different countries. If you ask for a glass of Pinot here, you will very likely get something Italian and white. But if you do the same in the US, then you'll get a glass of red. So what is going on? What is Pinot? And why are its grapes some of the most highly prized in the world of wine? In the beginning was the grape. And of course it went forth and multiplied and became more and more diverse. We're going to call this original grapevine Vitis. Now Vitis evolved into around 79 different species of plant. And they all work in very similar fashions. They like to put their effort into growing tall focusing the growth on the highest up part of the plant. 
and they make small bunches of flowers called inflorescences. The flowers themselves are both male and female at the same time and can be pollinated by the wind. And of course, if the flower is pollinated, it forms a berry, which the plant loads up with sugar that it makes from the sunlight, and it also puts in delicious flavours, all trying to get animals to eat that berry and transport the seed within all around the world. Most of the grapes that we turn into wine are from the family known as Vitis vinifera, which originated in Asia and literally means making wine. Other species of the Vitis vine include the American Riparia, Labrusca and Rupestris, from which we get grapes for eating or for making jam. However, we also use these vines in winemaking for their resistance to the nasty bug Phylloxera. These form the roots of the plant and your Vitis vinifera, the wine grape, is grafted up on top. There is increasing interest in hybrids between multiple Vitis species as these can be much better at resisting diseases like mildew. However, the grapes that these produce, such as Phoenix, Rondo and Saval Blanc, are perhaps unfairly not seen as noble or as producing such appealing wines as the purebred vinifera. Perhaps this will change over time, particularly with the desire to reduce the use of pesticides and with pressure from climate change. Now, all of the Pinot family are Vitis vinifera vines that have evolved in different ways. There has been a lot of DNA analysis done at UC Davis in California to work out which grape evolved from which, and the Pinot family seems to have started with a vine known as Tramina or Savagnin from Austria. In the world of wine grapes, the Pinot's family tree is by far the most complex. Astonishingly, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris and Grigio and Pinot Blanc have almost identical DNA profiles. There are then 21 known offspring, including, yes, Chardonnay, Aligote, the Muscadet grape Melon and Gamay from Beaujolais. It's really quite incredible to think that these almost identical plants can go on to produce grapes, which then creates such a panoply of wine styles. But it does get even more interesting now, you may have heard the word clone. That might bring up images in your mind of the Matrix and mad scientists doing things with sheep. Behave. Anyway, it's not at all like that. All plants naturally mutate and evolve, and viticulturalists around the world have for centuries looked around their vineyard and spotted the occasional vine which was behaving differently and better. For example, it might produce darker-skinned grapes, or it might be more resistant to droughts, or they might just have more space between the grapes, helping keep it disease-free. They then take cuttings of that vine and propagate it, potentially into a whole new vineyard, all of which has exactly the same DNA as that original plant. This is what they call clonal selection. Now, these clones tend to end up with really catchy names, like 888 or who could forget the classic 114. Um, oh, just me. Yeah, viticulture geeks are weird. And while it was the French who really kicked this off, New clones are now defined all around the world, from Napa or Switzerland, New Zealand, and winemakers have their own favourites, each with its own set of quirks. Let's have a quick look at three different Pinot Noir clones just as an example. On the left here, the Dijon clone 777 has small tight bunches, and you can really see the pine cone shape from which the word Pinot, meaning pine, comes. The next clone has grapes of very different sizes, potentially offering a wider range of flavours, and while the third has looser berries. If you're in a cooler, wetter country like Germany or England, the moisture can get trapped in those tight 777 bunches, and the whole lot will rot, whereas a looser bunch allows the air in to dry it all out. So that's clones, and this is one of the biggest sources of differences in the wine. What many winemakers will do is to plant different clones so they can create the final style of wine that they're going for. Just look at this chart which shows the differences between the flavours and the body and the tannin. It's really quite astonishing that all of these are Pinot Noir. So, going a bit more into the Pinot family itself, we have obviously Pinot Noir, which is also known as Schwertburgunder, and Pinot Nero in Italy. This is seen as the oldest and most important variety of Pinot, and it thrives in cooler regions such as Burgundy, Oregon, Hemelonard in South Africa, Martinborough in New Zealand, Germany, and of course in Champagne. Pinot Noir is famously a very delicate grape. Too much heat will destroy it, it's susceptible to rot, and even to viruses such as fan leaf. We will of course talk a bit more about that later. Pinot Meunier, also known as Schwarz Riesling or just Meunier, is named after the delicate dusty coating on the plant's leaves. Meunier means miller in French and it looks like someone has just dusted the vine with flour. This dark-skinned grape which evolved from Pinot Noir is generally used in Champagne, but can also make delicious red, rosé or even white still wines. Now, Meunier is a very rare kind of evolution known as a chimera, where the plant actually has two different sets of DNA. Here, only one layer of the plant got the mutation and the other is still pure Pinot Noir. 
As an experiment, in 2002, scientists took and separated one cell from each of these two layers and turned it into a vine. The inner layer produced 100% normal Pinot Noir, whereas the outer made a very, very odd micro vine that basically didn't work at all. So Meunier lives a very fragile existence. Pinot Gris, Grauburgunder or Pinot Grigio is a very interesting one, and I'll leave Jamie to go into the differences as we taste wines 2 and 3. But this has a grey-purple skin which is really unique and allows it to make white or even rosé wines. It's also permitted in Champagne, and one of our favourite producers, Fox & Fox, makes a sensational English sparkling wine out of 100% Pinot Gris. Pinot Blanc, also known as Weissburgunder or Pinot Bianco, also mutated from Pinot Noir and suddenly lost all its colour. Mainly found in Alsace, it was often mistaken in vineyards for a very similar looking Chardonnay. This can be used as the base wine in Champagne, and is often a bit of a workhorse, producing slightly dull styles. However, with careful treatment you can produce excellent full-bodied aromatic wines. We'll see what you think of this one in a little bit. But that is an overview of the Pinot family, how it came about, and tonight we are going to be tasting examples from across the world, showing how the landscapes, weather and winemaking techniques can influence this incredible family of grapes. I think I make it time to go back to the studio and find out whether our first wine, the Pinot Blanc, is a hit or miss. Welcome back. Jamie's busy looking up something on the internet. Well, what's that? Oh. Pinot Noir. <laughs> um, so what do you guys think? There's some, there's some really um, interestingly sheepy looking uh, comments in there, but, but with some cracking sort of the, the, a description of all the good fruits that people have captured. You know, there's, I, I have to say, Pinot Blanc, I've been put off a little bit because some of the, I think it was Oz Clark said a while ago that Pinot Blanc, he thought, was going to be one of England's secret weapon grapes because he saw it again as quite similar to how Alsace used to be. Um, although we do get a bit more rain, don't we? Because it's there in this rain shadow. But I've tried some really quite dull ones. And then we tried one the other day and it was absolutely incredible. So this is definitely, it's, it doesn't have as much character as that one, but that was a bonkers winemaking technique. Mm. This is just a very careful, precise winemaking technique, isn't I, it? I think what's important is, you know, and what, what we've seen in the video that not all wines are created the same, not all grapes are created the same, and not no. all clones. So even the same grape in the same place in a different yeah. row can be a different grape, quote unquote. And this is why I, I always bang on about don't make blanket statements about yeah. wine. Don't say I don't like Riesling. Don't say I don't like Pinot Blanc. Don't say I don't Because there's going to be, you, you've just seen how many different iterations of mm. a single all these grape. a yeah. single grape can be. Um, but this is beautiful, and this 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 was a tough pick as to to what to start with, um, because you know with with the Pinot world, you know Alsace is really really famous for its its reasoning, its virtuosity, and potentially its Pinot Gris, yeah. um, and then Pinot Blanc kind of it it kind of sits in the background a mm. little bit. Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir do very very well in Alsace, um, but you know Riesling and Gewurz are the the two big ones that you really hear a lot about. So I thought let's get a Pinot Blanc in. Dof are they're one of the since 1517, yeah, it's about 13, 13, yeah, 13, 13 generations, 13 yeah. generations they, they were the guys who got the Cremont de Alsace, which is your sparkling mm -hmm. wine ever out of Alsace. They got that recognised as, a, yeah. as a, a real term. Which is a top tip, by the way. Cremont d'Alsace is every bit as good as uh, many champagnes, and they are superb, really really great value wines. So, um, so yeah, but this one, um, they... they I think the thing about Pinot Gris is that you do have to be incredibly careful with it because the bulk of what it's grown for is to going into the champagne style. But this is a Pinot Blanc. Sorry, did I say Pinot Gris? I meant Pinot Blanc. He's though. excited about the next wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am excited about the next two wines, in fact. But um, yeah, and this they they still, even though it's quite a reasonably priced bottle of wine, they still hand harvest every single grape in this, and that's that's not a small undertaking. No, but if you want to say anything out of mm. Alsace, the wines are great. But it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It Steep is. hillsides. You're sitting in the Vosges Mountains. So the wines are protected. And you can get these really kind of like bright, high acid styles. Um, because you've got the mountains, you get the coolness. You get this high acidity. And it's one of the driest places in yeah. all of France. Um, which allows them to have their pick of the bunch. Literally. Yeah, it, it, it helps keep um, the diseases controlled. Now, oh, this year has been a hideous one in France in general for all sorts of reasons, but the, the, what's hitting now is the vineyards got smashed up by hail and uh, earlier in the year. They had the frosts 
um, which killed off all of the growth. And now it's just been wet and cold and wet and cold. And so um, for everywhere that isn't Elsass, you know, you look at the Chardonnay that's growing in Burgundy this year, it's taking an absolute beating from downy mildew. Uh, downy mildew is a kind of weird sort of thing, which is part, I, I can't really describe it. it. It involves things that crawl up out of the soil after a bit of heavy rainfall and just just, just love to destroy grapes and um, go crazy on them. So, so it's hard work. So having little advantage, like this little mountain range that drops all of its water on one side and leaves the other side nice and dry, is a, a real secret to making a consistently good wine. It's great. And you look at that, and the other thing that, that helps is you have, you know, the wind gets funneled down the mountainside. It's yeah. very similar to what you have in the Rhone Valley, that mm -hmm. that wind comes through that pulls away any little bit of moisture there is to keep yeah. you this long, dry growing season. So if you want to pick something early, and get great high acid you can, you can but yeah. on the other hand you can leave it and leave it and leave it if you want to do a late harvest something right with a little bit of sweetness yeah. this is absolutely bone dry this is less than a gram residual sugar in um so absolutely bone dry bottle of wine. I, I think but as what, a seafood what, what are you eating i was just about to say yeah, what are you what are you eating God. with this yeah well i actually had a pinot blanc the other night when i i went out for a meal out which was which is quite rare for me because i'm normally sat in here working so um so yes and we had it with uh oh, a mixture so, someone was having it with um a sort of crispy calamari and um, there, the, obviously, the, that's deep fried, so you've got a little bit of fat with it, so the acidity helps cut through that. And what do you I mean? You squeeze lemon juice on fre uh, fresh fish, don't you? So, and on your calamari, so that lemon flavour that's coming through, it's, it's an absolute natural pairing. I think so, I think so. And I had it with scallops, and those were cracking with it as well. And this is the joy, because I think it is a grape that doesn't get enough love, no. enough no. exposure, and stuff from that. But I think that's a. Yes. Enough of the blonde, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the Dolly the sheep loving it as well. So, yeah, the re the, 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 the sheep thing, it was just, um, uh, I don't know if you remember, the, I think it was the first animal that was cloned, wasn't it? It was Dolly the sheep. It and, was. Uh, yeah, so. That's that we know of. That's we know of anyway. But, um, but yeah, uh, absolutely, um, absolutely delicious wine. But we are going to be moving on to two wines which are the same grape. But different. But different. And so, you would never mistake a Pinot Gris for a Pinot Grigio or the other way around. Um, so, and Secchetto are, are largely known more for their sort of Prosecco, but they're in that region and they make Pinot Grigio and they make a lot of it and it's it's delicious. So You're going to have to pour for yourself. I'll pour for myself, that around. is fine. I so think I, think, I think what's important to say is Pinot Grigio does sometimes, you know, A, it's a massively, massively popular grape, but B, sometimes it does get a little bit of a bad rap of being a... An entry level wine and cheap and cheerful, and all it tastes of is a bit of lemon and a bit of pear, and that's about it. And then, you know, Pinot Gris goes, Oh, it's Alsace and this, and it's rich and it's all that kind of stuff. And it's not that one is better than the other, no. it's not that this is right and this is wrong. Italy made Pinot Grigio the drink of choice for every pub in the land it's like yeah. i'll have a glass of pinot glass of pinot glass of pinot and that that did really really well and it makes a delicious quaffable drinkable style that you can drink by itself but it's got enough acidity and enough fun that you can have a little bite to eat with it pinot gris generally you'll find has a little bit more richness about it and you know we'll see when we get into the video with it but it's all about it's just a short one. This it's one. it's all it's all about style um, because um, you know a lot of people will know that Shiraz and Syrah are exactly the same yep. thing. You know Syrah you find in the south of France generally a little savory, earthy, earthy, more savoury, yeah. and then Shiraz goes you know fruity. big fruity yeah. jammy. We we think of Australia with that, but then when it gets into a different part of the world, so we take you know um, New Zealand, New Zealand, you'll see some people make Pinot Grigio, which is going to mm. be this light fresh quaffable fun style of wine and then you'll see people making pinot gris in the same areas same grapes same thing same climate but they're going for a different style of wine so yeah. it's how these wines can be different stylistically and it's about what is the right wine for the right occasion you know and that's the same with everything you know people go oh here's an absolutely massive bordeaux it scored 100 points it's the best thing ever but if i'm sat on the beach at 40 degrees that, that's that's not the bottle of wine for me and, you know, it's the same with all these wines. It's, you know, we do these tastings and this is great and we get to try these things. But what we've got to think about is where would this wine sit in the real world? What would you enjoy? What would you have? Perhaps we should try to put the video on. Let's go straight to the video. Um, I'll we'll be in the chat. Happens. So give me a shout and answer any questions that you want to do. Let's go to the video. This is why we drink. Pinot Grigio and Pinot Gris are in fact the exact same grape variety. 
It's a white grape, which has a greyish, brownish, pinkish skin, hence its name. Now, the grape originated in France, where it's most cultivated in Alsace, and across the border in Italy, it's known as Pinot Grigio. But it is really the Italians that we have to thank for bringing such a huge global recognition and fame to the variety. While they are the same grape, the two names have come to infer two very different styles of wine. Pinot Grigio wines are typically lighter-bodied, crisp, fresh, and with vibrant stone fruit and floral aromas with perhaps a touch of spice. But in contrast, Pinot Gris wines are more full-bodied, richer, spicier, and much more viscous in texture. They also tend to have greater cellaring and aging potential. But even when these grapes are grown away from their home countries, the way these wines will be labelled is usually indicative of the style that they're trying to produce. So what have we got here? Well, we start with Sacchetto in the Veneto region in northern Italy. The founder was Sisto Sacchetto, who set up the vine and winemaking trade in the early post-war period. Sisto's son, Filiberto, has strengthened and developed its sales all around the world. The Pinot Grigio della Venezia is one of many wines from the estate. It's bright, it's fresh, it's easy drinking. And it's fermented in stainless steel tanks to keep the amazing flavours of the lemon and pear. It's a delicious, easy drinking wine that shows how simple but subtle winemaking can deliver a lovely drop of juice. This wine would be fantastic with seafood canapes and light seafood pasta dishes. With Wine 3, we head to New Zealand to visit our friends at Lake Chalice, who, if you've been on these tastings for a while, may remember that we have featured previously. Established in 1989 with a vision of producing internationally recognised wines from the heart of the Marlborough region, Lake Chalice feature the Kareareara on every single bottle of their wine. These birds favour the remote mountains and the foothills of the upper Awatere and Wairau valleys, and these are home to Lake Chalice's three vineyard sites. This time we're drinking their Nest Pinot Gris. Like the Pinot Grigio, it underwent a steady, cool fermentation to try to retain the delicate aromatics. But this had further aging on light leaves to build texture, resulting in a balanced wine with bright aromatics, crisp natural acidity, and a little bit more body. This has a touch more sweetness than the Pinot Grigio, so it also helps it produce a weightier wine that pairs beautifully with grilled chicken or pork and apple sauce. But the important thing here is, it's the right wine for the right occasion. And isn't it amazing how the, the same grape grown in different places can be so vastly different? So, with that all done, let's get back to the studio to see your tasting notes and find out what your favourite was. Welcome back. We're here again. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, there was a great comment in there that people got to actually focus really on the focus. wine for a minute. Yeah, so a bit, that's what we're looking for. A little bit of focus. Everybody's happy. So, two very different wines, two very, very delicious wines. Um, and more in common than I was expecting, uh, because, you know, I don't think I've ever tasted them side by side before. And this is the joy of having the, you know, these samples for, for a tasting like this, because you probably wouldn't open a bottle of Pinot Grigio and a bottle of Pinot Gris, you know, when you're on your own in the evening. But I think, I think the, well, you, the you Pinot Grigio would, stands you up. You would if it? I wasn't there. Oh, well, possibly, yeah. So I think that's the thing. I really think if anyone on the planet opened these two mm. wines side by side, there there would be an expectation that the w wine number three, because it says Gris, would be the more exciting, the more intense, the more whatever, which I agree that it, yeah, probably, it probably is. is. Yeah. But I think, you know, not all Pinot Grigios are created no. equal in the Pinot Grigio of Italy world. There's some that are just cold, wet, white, watery, and do the job. You've had a bad day at work and you just need something cold out of the fridge that you can get that, you know, in, in same as in the world of beer. You know, there's some great craft lagers, some phenomenal ales, but sometimes you just want a cheap and cheerful lager that does the job. And this is a step up from that cheap and cheerful lager, but it's, it, it I think really it's is. absolutely delicious. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's still a family business. It's, it, I think there's three generations that have been doing it and um, they have an absolutely state-of-the-art winery with a beautiful, beautiful viewing room. So it looks like a sort of a really cool place to go and visit. Um, so yeah, the, the Sacchetto, it, it's a really delicious wine. But I'll tell you what, what, the, what really stands out to me. And when you're measuring the, you know, when you're talking about how good is a wine, we've talked again about the balance, the, the length, the intensity and the complexity. The, what stands out to me is the length on the Pinot Gris. It just, the flavour just keeps on going and going. Whereas that is a, you know, it's a hit of beautiful, simple flavours. And it's really refreshing. But that, the other one just goes on and on. 
Absolutely. So a little bit about the winery. So um, Sacchetto is Sacchetto family, been yep. in the family since I think ni- 1920, they've been making these wines. And it's gone down through generation to generation. And they make, I think it's about 40 or 50 different wines, a selection of sparklings yeah. and grigios and reds and all kind of stuff. And all designed just to be great drinkable wines. Mm. And, you know, they're up in the up in the Veneto, so they're up in the north of Italy, which is your cooler part of Italy. And this is why you're able to get this high acid and this freshness. You know, a lot of the very, very, you know, easy going Pinot come from a little bit further south where it's a little bit warmer. Therefore, they get more ripeness, more yield, and then they get more grapes per acre, and they're able to make whatever they make. Um, but this is beautiful. I think it's, it's, it's almost got a sort of. It reminds me of limoncello because you know when you've got that sort of artificial light lemon flavour and something that's made with real lemons, and it's almost the zests getting in. It's got it that there. zippiness, hasn't it? Yeah, that zippiness, yeah. absolutely. And then Lake Chalice. Um, for those of you who've been uh, <laughs> with us from the beginning, you you might know we is obsession a little bit, but. They've been great. They've supported with what we've tried to do with the Online Wine Tasting Club from day one. Um, when we did our first ever hybrid tasting at the yeah. beginning to kind of showcase what Discoverers was versus, versus Adventurers. Which was, coincidentally, almost one year ago, because that was in September last year. We've been doing this for it's a year now. A, a very you would have thought we'd bought a decent internet connection by now. Yeah, or shirt, but apparently not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not shirt. It's an improvement on last week's. <laughs> So, the, this is, uh, uh, Jamie, I'm pretty sure when he was writing the script uh, for the last video, uh, I, which I then applied my little finesse to at the end, and oh, what did uh, you I do? thought, oh God, he's going to make me say car re again and try to pronounce this unpronounceable bird, but yeah, it, it's, it, it looks like a beautiful thing. I think there's some real hiking around this region, it's, it's right up in the sort of national park and it is, it's stunning, oh, no, I know. I, We've talked to them to see about yeah. how we go to New Zealand. Yeah, these guys have been making wine in the Lake yeah. Chalice brand since um, late, late, late 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they make phenomenal Sauvignon. They make phenomenal mm. um, Gris. Um, they, make re- they make lots of different styles of wine. But what most of their wines have, um, have in common is they are the, these beautiful, rich, aromatic styles. Yeah. Lots on the nose. Um, there's a bit more sugar. In the mm-hmm. Lake Chalice than there is in the um, in the Grigio, not by much. You're going from about four ish percent up to about six percent, but you can definitely tell there's this slightly off dry feel yeah. about you know, and I think that's what gives that richness and that length of finish is that little bit of yeah, just it's, a little bit of weight it, to it. So, yeah, it's yeah. more weightiness than sweetness is yeah. what that what that sugar adds to it. Um, but it's all in balance because the the acidity is still there as well. Um, no, I'm so. Something that um, I'm not surprised about drinking the wine, when I was researching this, I, um, it, it was clear that they use stainless steel tanks for all their temperature, fermenta- temperature controlled fermentation. That means, you know, compared to, it's not impossible to control the temperature in a barrel fermentation. Um, you sort of need to put these big metal plates into the barrels and pump the. Add some, the sta- add some stainless steel to yeah, it. Put some stainless steel in it, but it still gets the effect of the wood. Um, Alsace is a bit more sort of. Um, uh, he- heavy on its use of oak, but it's all Rust- very old. Rustic in its rustic, approach. Well, yeah, and rustic's perhaps harsh, but but they 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 like these big, big oak things called foudre, which are you know uh, it, just massive. Some of them, and what that does is it limits the amount of oak to the wine ratio. But I don't know why I'm talking about that because we're not talking about Alsace Pinot Gris. We're talking about this one. Um, and the tasting notes: smooth lemon lime. Yeah, de- absolutely, definitely there. Honeysuckle, but, tropical, the floral, tropical. lots of floral in there. Yeah. Mango, I like that. Tangerine, I like that as well. You yeah. know what I'm really happy with? No animals. No, no animals. A, no, notes, animal, yeah. no animal notes Someone's in this one. So that's that, good. Yeah. Someone's now going to do it to be funny, but hey, that's what it is. Well, so, yeah. Well, well, what, what, which do you prefer? Not that it's one versus the other. Or is, are you genuinely going to sit on the fence and go, it depends what I want? No, it's, it's like. <laughs> fence sitter. I am very much a fence sitter. <laughs> okay. if, if I had, if I had to, the, the sommelier geek in me yeah i think this is a more a more interesting one this has more about it more that yeah. you know i i couldn't i couldn't sit with the sacchetto and have a half hour conversation about the layers of flavor in it no. but if i'm outside in the sunshine and i just want a cold glass of water, it's beautiful it's nice it's fresh it's delicious it does what it does and i think it's a great glass of wine for someone who's maybe not into wine and wants to get into wine it's, it's a good way to get into a white wine that's not overly oaky or overly acidic and it's 
it's not too driven one way or the other. It's a great down the middle of the road that if you're having an event with a bunch of people around, get some of that and everyone's going to be very happy. But I for... can't stop thinking about this tangerine. It, it, when, stick your nose in there if you've still got some. It really is quite... It, 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 it smells like that smell. I didn't have tangerines at any other time of year other than Christmas, really. I, I was pretty hopeless with with uh, tangerines but the moment one would come out of your stocking that, that's that's like opening your Christmas stocking yeah stocking so, so jo Joanne's put a, uh, a little note in the chat saying mm -hmm. her favourite would still be a Pinot Gris from the Alsace yeah and you know what honestly they do it better than most people in the world because they've they been do. doing it for that long I just couldn't over I wanted to get the doff in <laughs> and I could, yeah. we, we, we can do too many Alsace with that but what I would like to do at some we point we will do an entirely Alsace one won't we yes yes that, we've probably got to do that on location though don't we have we? to do that on location do that on location this is, this is yeah we've just got to work out next time Caroline's in the Lake District and then we'll we'll do it from there um, in the Lake District yeah. could do um, oh no Caroline can be in the Lake District and we'll be in Alsace moving on swiftly because I think we've talked about Pinot Gris Pinot Grigio we've explained it perhaps we should have a little bit about what's going on around the rest of the world and um, wow it's been a it's an been an interesting week, week. um <laughs> So it kind of seems that over the last year, each month our wine news has been what part of the world is on fire yeah. at the moment, or and, flooded, or and you know, might. and it, it really it, it kind of, it kind of clicks, you know, that, that climate change is a real thing. Depending, is, you know, yeah. don't talk to America, you know, <laughs> um, but it is, and there, there's a lot of things happening, and you know, obviously there's you know devastation across that, but then there's the line of what vineyards are doing to change and grow and whatever yeah. to be able to do this, and how powerless um, they are sometimes. And but, I think what's hit this week, you, you, there's no way you can fight it. You just have to almost pray there's no lightning strikes near because what's happening. Obviously, I, you're probably aware down in the south of France in Provence where all of the rosé comes from these days, and uh, all of the celebrity rosé. All the celebrity rosé. Yeah, no, the, you joke that the, it was made from Sanso, but it's actually made from celebrity cash, as far as I can tell. But, you know, Chateau Mirabeau has been, you know, the fires have been sailing very, very close very, by. Very, very and close. And it got started from what they reckon, a discarded cigarette. Yeah. And 7,000 acres, I think, is the current number. And that's since Monday. Wow. Just that's <laughs> shocking. Done. And, you know, that leads to, you know, smoke taint and damaged vines and... Yeah, um, even if you don't get hit by the fires, your wine and, probably and, won't be great. And, because no one's well, like, I really want a smoky rosé. Yeah, especially at this point, because this, this is key point, as the grapes are starting to come out and ripening starting to happen, and people are actually getting close in some parts of the world in the warmer yeah. things, thinking about when they might be taking these grapes off the vine. Yeah, if not starting, you know, when we yeah. When we looked at the, um, the California ones last year, it was like September, October yeah. time, they, you can't say with what happened anyone was lucky, because lucky is not lucky the word. But right. as far as the wine was, the vast majority of grapes had got off the vines. So for the wine being produced that year, yeah. a lot of people were who who weren't in the direct as long as flames your coming. Wasn't, yeah, wasn't destroyed, as long as yeah. the you know the flames coming through, you mm -hmm. you you were you were you okay if you if damage, you were in the vicinity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got that. Um, so fingers crossed, not too many people get damaged. Hopefully, you know we're going to have some good rosés. They can't physically put the price up anymore, <laughs> that's so true, so that's that's, true, that's a yeah. different story. Um, but yeah, maybe stockpile whispering angel or something if that's that's your thing, or yeah. or, 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 or go for a place which makes equally good wine, like the Langer Dock, and don't pay the same price. And you'll you'll have the, the, you know some wonderful Bertrand um, rosés. Oh, Gerard Langedoc. Bertrand Gris yeah, is fantastic. Grenache so, Gris is fantastic. Um, but just to be fair, when Alex is uh, super famous from doing 500 shows of this, <laughs> when you see Taylor's Provence Rosé, all right, you can come don't and touch it. Come and down, yeah. You can come down and give him a slap. Yeah, um, that's fair. So, but in, in lighter news, mm. I say lighter news, something came out. So there's um, Sting from the police fame. He, he bought, a, um, he bought a, a, a winery over in Italy, and um, it's come out in the last couple of weeks. It may not have been quite what he signed up for, um, that, um, so he's got uh, Il Paglion um, over in Tuscany and the, the Duke of whoever it was was um, attempting to sell it to him and was uh, handing him off a couple of glasses. Would you like a wine from the Carafe? Oh, yeah, have a taste of that, taste of that. So um, what we found out was uh, that was not the wine from the winery. <laughs> he was handing him off a little bit of Barolo. Um, oh dear. 
And so the story goes that so uh, Stig went in um, and bought this, and he then <laughs> saw guests coming around tasting it. There's a there's a nut. I can't remember. I think it might have been in Decanter magazine that I read this. That there was um guests were walking around the grounds and he saw them pouring the wine into the flower beds um, to go, that's what it is. But now they make 150,000 bottles a year. Um, they were in the top the top 101 wines um, in Italy a couple of years back. Why 101? I don't know. Um, because they were 101st? Uh, I don't know. But um, but he does uh, he does go uh, into the cellar and sing to the wine. And he does oh, have, right. And he does have a wine called Message in a bottle. Of course he does. Of I mean, course he does. But but there, there was there was a, the headline of Sting da, 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 with this whatever. I just don't know why it wasn't Sting got stung. Indeed, I mean, the, the the sun really let the world down on that one, didn't they? They exactly. produced some crackers on other occasions. But exactly. There we are. That is what we were about. Now, I I, I haven't actually looked at the orders today because we haven't we, we decided we'd make another video at uh, at very late notice, which is of no surprise to anybody that knows us. Um, but um, Jamie had mentioned that he was going to ask a question at some point. Is that not yet? No, that's not yet. That's, that's, not yet. Not yet. that's, that's coming okay. later. That's coming later. Relax. Oh, good. So you can uh, have a bit of relax. anticipation and start sort relax, of googling relax, relax. things to do with. So I'm going to give everyone about thirty seconds because yeah, it's wine time this. and it's challenge time it is yeah it's challenge time and it is a three-way challenge and for those who um do both our tastings if you joined us two weeks ago when we did uh wines of argentina mm -hmm. we had a two the percent three-way tie between yeah. myself caroline and alex as two had put the best argentinian <laughs> wine so today we thought we would do the same again and we are going to have a three-way tasting um that's between... designed just for our club member ian burris yeah, absolutely. Ian, if you're watching, we love you dearly because we know how much you love Pinot Noir and all things yep. Pinot. We've got a case of each coming to you straight away. If you want the tasting. opposite of, of Miles from Sideways, that's Ian. Um, exactly. But we hope he might come on at some point soon. Have you asked him? I have. I have. Oh, good. I have. Very I have. Yeah. I have. But once again, any lovely wine people out there, we're looking because yeah. as much as you love us dearly, after a year's worth of this, you're probably bored with us. So if anyone is a wine geek, has a real passion about some kind of wine and would like to, now we can travel around a little bit, has a specialist subject and wants to get down into the studio with us and be a part of this tasting and pick the wines and come and have a little bit of fun, we would love to have you. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. You'll just come it, and hang out with yeah, us. Give us a shout. Come and hang out and um, drink some wine with us. And, you know, we're, we're, we're not as bad as we seem on the internet. We're lovely, really. Um, Call the police. It's oh, that's stranders. Um, no. So I'm going to give everyone a second because we're going to do three side by side. So if you want to dive in and grab another glass, yeah, or well, we two, could, we could start with the the first two proper ones, couldn't we? We could start with the first because yeah, okay. The so, one. so to be fair, it was a challenge. It was a challenge between myself, like no, because everyone's going to think that we bully Caroline, and then they're all going to vote for her wine. Um, <laughs> but. Um, we decided so, Alex. Um, as you may know, uh, I don't mind. I like, Clay, I like Clay Vergier. <laughs> um, he likes his burgundies. Um, yeah, I can't afford them anymore. The and and I may well have mentioned once or twice I spent a little bit of time in America, so I have yeah. a slight obsession. So, <clears throat> me and Alex were going to do USA versus Burgundy, a bit of judgment of Paris esque yeah. kind of thing. And the last time we did this, um, which was in a private tasting way back last year. Um, the the Santa Barbara County uh, um, Pinot Noir um, narrowly edged out Burgundy, and so uh, I'm I'm kind of itching for a bit of a revenge here. So because you, you, there's no denying that that America makes absolutely sensational Pinot Noirs. The wines on your side. Been around them on um, uh, on many occasions, and uh, um, I've visited the winery at. Uh, um, uh, uh, Domaine de la Cote, which is where Sashi Mormon and Raj Parr uh, make their incredible wines, and and it was a bit of an inspiration for this place. So I've done you know loads of other ones, and um, even recreated the sideways trail myself when I travelled back there on my own back in I think it must have been about two thousand and five. However, it always comes back to Burgundy. You know, they're they're getting better at making Burgundy style wines, but Burgundy's getting better at massaging out some of their less pleasant tendencies that they used to have in days of old it was it's burgundy so it's good enough you will like what we make um because it's burgundy 
And yeah, he's, he's forgot to mention that my Sandy Pinot Noir versus his um, French Pinot Noir. Mine was about thirty-five quid, and his was a hundred and ten, and it still beat it. But I, that's got nothing to do with anything. Narrowly, narrowly. Please, may I please have some uh, twill? You may, yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Twill be a good idea to open that. <laughs> he's, he wants to get the first one in for that, and he's failed. Never you twill, mind. you won't. Oh, you may have noticed that in the background of the Poly V this time, Jamie has been clever enough with his many IT skills. <laughs> doesn't doesn't get to fixing internet connections. My, my one IT skill <laughs> of downloading a picture. The vi pictures of the vineyards themselves in the background. So what you're looking at there is is the vineyards Rene Monnier. of Ronnie Monnier. Yep. And so Rene Monnier, he has a winery which is in the heart of Mansour, isn't it? It um, is. And so this is you know proper Burgundy country, and um, uh, he makes some incredibly, incredibly expensive wines, and very, very well. Sorry, it's not René Monnier. I should, I should let me be clear. So, René this Monnier, was the previous owner, Xavier Xavier Monnier. So Xavier Monnier is the winemaker yeah. for René Monnier now. That's right. I'm getting my the, the Monnier and Mono is too confusing. However, Xavier Mono makes some under his own label. He makes one for, for other houses. And he's got an absolutely beautiful cellar, which I'm just going to quickly uh, show you because it's, 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 it's very pretty. You know, it's that classic long cellar that goes out under the, under the chalk of Burgundy. And that's the only place where you can really mature a wine in those perfect, stable conditions with all of the character that comes in from what lives in that cellar. It's it's Burgundy. It's the history of wine. It is so ancient and beautiful and wonderful. So I'm going to tell you. You're ancient now. and beautiful. <laughs> not wonderful though. No, I'm not uh, going to no, go that far. Not. Um, you need to get some poured so you can have a you can yeah. have a bang on comparison. Let's, let's here. have another tip of this. We, now we featured the thing. It was a previous vintage of this. Was in um, our Christmas. Our Christmas station. I, I, I like I like Rene Monnier. I, yeah. I like it. I think it does good Burgundy. I think it does an approachable <sighs> style. It's got good drinking. The, the thing for me, a lot of, and anyone who's a som out there is going to come and like cut my head off for this. Um, but sometimes, like Burgundy is just a bit too earthy, a bit too dry, a bit. You can't just have a glass of Burgundy. You've got to have an occasion for Burgundy. It's got to be. Mister, I don't food. make blanket statements. <laughs> I want to get a blanket and put it over your head in a minute. But, but seriously, this, this is fruit forward, and they they have learned. They haven't existed. They relied on their their reputation for for too long, and now they've learned. And winemaking knowledge, it, it, the the best universities for winemaking in the world are in California and in uh, and in in Burgundy. You know, it, not it, not not Plumpton then. Plumpton is up there, but it's not <laughs> the best. It, absolutely not. And I think they would admit themselves. But. This is not that one-sided earthiness, um, leather, tobacco, and sort of things that just come from aging and you know that developments of those tannins. This is a very, very pleasant and elegant wine. And the first step they do to make this wine, they start off by doing what's what's called a cold maceration. And I, I might need to just quickly check. I think it's six hours, wasn't it? Or was it six days? I think it might have been six days. Um, where's it gone? Yeah, six whole days. They kept the grapes absolutely chilled after harvest, and that's not what you mostly expect. When winemakers like to talk about how close their vineyard is to the winery, which allows them to get the grapes straight in and process them in beautiful condition, well, the first thing that they do is leave them there for six days without allowing them to do any fermentation. It's counterintuitive, but the temperatures drop right, right, right down to just let it sit there and it's again it's just this process that very slowly and very gently starts to bring out those really elegant tannins and, and makes a really rounded wine and then he's doing all of the fermentation in steel again just like we've we've seen on the the other two uh, the, the, or the the three pinots so far that we've done and that is all cold temperature controlled a bit of a mix of punching down um, as the fermentation goes on, apologies if you've seen our extraction video and you know this already, all of the grape skins rise up to the top because they're pushed by the you're carbon dioxide. Some, you're getting some good notes here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. They bully me so much. You, you, no, you can, you can, you I, I, think, I think this is just an absolutely delicious wine. Mm. So to try to extract those flavours really gently from the skin, you can't overwork Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a very thin-skinned, delicate grape. And if you bash it around by doing massive punch, pump overs... When I make my comments, you're going to be thin-skinned and delicate. Fair enough, fair enough. Or when we get into the judging. 
but I think <laughs> the original me. is the best. And uh, I say that while knowing that these are right in the same category as each other. But um, so yeah, they then they then transfer it into those age those barrels for aging, which allow the air to come in and provide their own little flavours. And they put 30% of them into brand new French oak. And trust me, there is a lot more to be said for being right next to the place that makes the barrels and makes the, and the, where the trees are grown. All of that stuff happens in a seamless movement as it has done for centuries. So I'm getting a little bit worried because all the tasting notes are the big, rich, fruity things, yeah. the, the blueberries, the cherries, the, um, oh, it's so the stuff that you don't I, There's not enough smoky and tannin and things for, for my liking. Yeah, for it's it not your classic sort of... Uh, the, I've got to be honest, that probably the worst wine I've ever had in my life was from Burgundy as well. And it was what they call a pass to gram, which is pretty much all the crap that's left over after they made anything good. And it was really cheap. And so my cheapskate student mindset said, I'll have a couple of bottles of that to like fill the boot of my Volkswagen Polo back before we drove back. The rest of it was filled with Druan, <laughs> which is, uh, they now also make wine in Oregon, which is where Jamie makes wine. So that says that there's a lot of respect between these two parts of the world. However, Oregon's hotter. And what I don't like in Pinot is where the alcohol dominates and it, 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 it's overpowered. Now, it doesn't just having a higher alcohol level doesn't mean you're going to overpower uh, the wine. It you, doesn't mean that. You, you, you you you're, to, you're talking my damn before I even get a chance. Gosh, yeah. hotter. And I haven't higher even alcohol tried it, but I bet it is. What's the percentage on this? Thirteen eight. Thirteen eight. Well, that's only twelve point five. Yeah. That's a whole percent difference. So. so you get drunk quicker on mine. Better value for money. So is that is that not the point? Is of this? that the responsible yeah. drinking? Okay, go on. Okay, so tell me about your one. So I I I, I love. I love all things Pinot, okay? Like, Burgundy does a job, but Burgundy for me... God, now I'm going to make another blanket statement. <laughs> so, Burgundy, Burgundy for me, if I, if I walk in somewhere and I pick up a Burgundy, I think mm -hmm. a Burgundy is going to be much more a food wine. It's going to have that yep. tannin. It's going to have that grip. It's going to be a little bit, a little bit lighter. I'll give you and that. if you buy a cheap one, it's going to be wishy-washy. Yeah, you, yeah. you, you've you got to spend a certain amount of money to get a solid Burgundy. Yeah? And you have to spend a solid amount of money to get a decent Pinot Noir, generally, um, unless you find some weird hidden gem somewhere. So you've got Burgundy, generally a little bit cooler, Therefore, a little bit lighter, a little bit lower in alcohol, a little bit more grip, a little bit more tannin, less ripeness, yeah? Okay? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard thing, okay? Yep. Then the other place I like that grows great, great Pinot Noir is California, yeah? True. But California, much hotter, much richer, much yeah. riper, and you can hit 14.5% alcohol. Oh, but these yeah. big, massive, they're absolutely bloody delicious. I think they're phenomenal, and some of the best... They can be, they can be, yeah. I'm with you on that. They yeah. can be excellent. They can they be when they're done. You've got to work this balance Sorry. out. Um, um, and that's great as well. What I feel with Oregon is Oregon sits the best of both worlds. You've got yeah. new world wow. wine making techniques. And you you know I'm a sucker for new world wines. Good. I like that my fruit. I like, I like my spice. Um, There's more kind of um, but, smoke. And but you're going but, further north. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're... You're saying you're saying latitude is Burgundy. You're there. It's yeah. the same. So you've got the same kind of climate. Really, it's a little bit warmer. Plus, you've got the, yeah, the bit of the influence from the ocean as well. Actually. So you've got ocean yeah. influence, but you know, it's 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 cooler than California. And I I really really believe that Oregon make, I think, across the board, the best value quality Pinot Noirs in the world. I'm not saying that they're yeah. cheap and whatever, but if you go, if you if you put an Oregon Pinot Noir and a Burgundy, okay, yeah, at the same price, the the one thing you can't say about Burgundy on the whole is that it provides great value for money. I think that ship has sailed a long time ago, and you know, the the sadly the wines that I was able to load my Polo back with and drive back, I win. Ian Burris has put for a Pinot Noir number five is okay. <laughs> that's all I need. There is no vote anymore for a am. Pinot Noir. Cola. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, so there is something slightly artificial about this, and I think they do a from just from what I'm getting on the nose, they do a lot of this whole bunch uh, fermentation. We've okay. talked about this loads of times. I'm not going to go into it again. Can, can I can I stop you for a minute? Because we're getting a bit excited here. Yeah. I think maybe we should get six in the glass and give Caroline a chance. Caroline, Caroline doesn't have a chance. Caroline, are you still there? 
Are you still there? Or should we uh, give everyone a second to get a video on? I'm going to get two more glasses. Yeah, you're going to get some you glasses. You keep talking. I'm going to get glasses for number six. So, yeah. Okay. So, I'll, what I, I think the, there's something else on because you know me, I'm a bit of a geek. So, the, the technical thing that's going on is that um, René Monnier, he likes to de-stem all of his grapes. He likes to take them off the, stel the, the stalks that hold, the, that hold all the grapes into those little perfect pine cone shaped bunches. And... That's done in this machine called a destemmer, which spins them around. And uh, I mean, you can do it manually if you're a masochist. But um, sometimes he likes to put 20% of the stalks back in to help improve the tannins. And it depends on how ripe the stalks are. It seems crazy to say it, but unripe stalks are green and unpleasant and bitter. Yeah. Brown stalks, the more brown they get... The, the more smooth flavours, the woody flavours that it's, it's putting into it. And that's that's quite nice. To go whole berry and whole bunch, like I think these guys have used, you have to get those stalks a lot riper. And that's where the heat of Oregon really, really does helps. help. It really helps. But equally, as I've said, I don't like banana as much. And I do get a bit of a banana flavour from that 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 particular type of sort of mass carbonic uh, flavour that's coming in. Okay, so what we did was we, we let Caroline pick her wine decide what her wine was um but she is uh, she's here she's in the chat she's hanging out she's, she's in the chat she, she's, she's 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 definitely not on holiday she's not she, she's not on holiday she's working off-site this week because exactly. she's absolutely wonderful and wonderful. looking after us and is in the chat and, for all your and, all your and needs just, you know she's but been doing an amazing we, job we, of the production we, process we thought we thought to make team. sure that everything was fair we would let caroline have her two cents on a video yeah but just to make sure it was okay I thought I'd sit in and uh, chat through this new wine with her. Yeah. So wine six is the Santa Macarena. No, don't do it. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Stop. You guys got jokes, man. We're funny. But anyway, let's we watch it. Let's we? yeah, let's watch Caroline's video okay. and let's get number six in the glass. Sounds good. Wine number six coming up. So moving on to wine number six. So we've done France, we've done Oregon. Yeah. And now we're going to, you know, Oregon is new world, but we're now going very, very New, New world. world, yes, um, something so, a bit different. So your pick is what? Well, I did think about stop. I did think about New Zealand because there's some great Pinot Noirs coming out of New Zealand as well. Again, stop. Um, but I, as you know, I love chili, so I've gone for cool climate Chilean Pinot Noir, and this one. Yes, it's called Santa Macarena, um, hence the silliness over here. Um, but I'm going to take a punt on this because the arena is in a different colour on the label. I'm going to take a punt that there's some sandy soil in that vineyard because arena means sand in Spanish. So this. And it's also near the beach, and, and beaches it, have sand. It is. It's just to help. The beaches vineyard. Have sand. Beaches do often come with sand. Yes, true, true fact. So you, I'm missing the cardinal point of this entire tasting. Yeah. I have no wine. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I was too busy talking. I'm so excited about my wine. I didn't pour you any. Um, so this Pinot Noir, it's from a single vineyard in cool climate Chile. Okay. So. When we talk when we talk about cool climate chili, yeah, how cool is cool? Because is it still a relatively warm area, but cool for chili, or is it just so cool in general? Um, a bit of both. Haha, -ha. I'll uh. get to I'll get as to why in a second. But chili, I'm sure everybody at home knows this fact. But chili is a very long, very thin country. Um, so it's about 1,400 kilometres long. Um, it goes from the driest desert in the world, Atacama, down to Patagonia, just north of the Antarctic. Um, and then it's really, really narrow as well. And on the one side, um, on the east side, you've got the Andes Mountains that go over to Argentina. And on the left side, you've got the coastal range um, of hills and, and Mountains? Are they mountains? The coastal range? They're technically mountains, but yeah. when you compare them to the Andes... They're, they're teeny tiny, right? Little mountains. Teeny tiny. Oh, hi, Alex. Hi. Aren't you producing? I am, yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, He's producing himself a glass of wine. But this is exactly. actually genuinely one of your favourites. You drink this as I, well. I drink this all the time. And when you said, come in on the challenge, I was like, yes, please, can I do Santa Maca and a Pinot Noir? Because I, I just think it's really, really great That's example funny. of Pinot Noir. Um, so this Hello. vineyard is the nearest it can possibly be to the coast in a region called Leida, which is in San Antonio, and that's just south of Casablanca. So that's in quite north for the Chilean wine regions. For a Chilean wine vineyard, it's actually quite cool. Um, the really warm bits are in the Central Valley, which okay. is in the valley um, and gets lots of sun um, and in the warmest part of the country. Because you're over nearer the coast, you get morning mists from the Humboldt cor current, which I'm sure you've just talked about. <laughs> Caroline, doing a pre-record to make sure that I know what to talk about in the previous segment. Obviously, this part's not live. Please continue. Is that because she's going on holiday? I'm so. not going on holiday. God, they're so mean to me. Um, so, yeah, you've got the morning mist coming in off the Humboldt cur current, but um, you've also it's also really prone to spring frost. So, as with anywhere that grows Pinot Noir, it makes it pretty difficult for the winemakers to grow a good grape. Um, but then because it's chilly, the daytime is really nice and warm. And then as the night time comes in, it gets very cool again. So what you have is a, a lovely warm bit, but time overnight for the grapes to recover and keep some of that elegance and delicacy. Absolutely, you've got this beautiful balance of, you know, it's it's warm during the days, yep. so that gives you nice heat to get ripeness. And if it stayed that hot the whole time, obviously the skin's getting grapey, it's going to burst, it's going to rot, yep. it's not going to be good. But you've got you've got two factors that really help. You've obviously got the altitude, yep. for that coolness, and then you've got the coastal influence as well. So you've got the best of both worlds to be able to get ripe fruit, but enough kind of in between time that you don't get this overly jammy over the top. Totally. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer, and I know we don't generally talk about price, and we're not going to talk about the exact price, but I'm a big believer that Pinot Noir shouldn't really be a cheap wine. It shouldn't be a cheap grape because it is so difficult to grow and mm. so difficult to do well. Um, and I think this, this, this shows pretty good value for money. But what is interesting about this more than anything is the alcohol is 14.5%. Yeah. It's it is high. It is really Pinot high, Noir. and you do get a real hit of warmth on the back of your palate um, at, on the finish. But you're right, you know, there's there's oodles of lovely fruit there, but there's a real sort of balance of acidity, um, and you still get a lot of elegance. It's not just a, you know, a, a warm climate Pinot Noir that's jammy and not much else going on. There's oodles going on here, and I think it's absolutely cracking value for money and you know suitable for sort of nights in on the sofa or you know a casual dinner with friends i think it's it's a really versatile wine and and it stands up to to food as well which is great i think you hit the nail on the head there with, the, with that word versatile um mm. because it is something you can just sit and have a couple of glasses mm. of it is something that could go with food and not get overwhelmed and yeah, this you know would go well with a burger it would mm. go well with some punchy seafood like you know tuna steak with olive tapenade or something like that i think that would be absolutely be beautiful. great sometimes when you get into you know south america there's sometimes just a blanket this is Chilean Pinot Noir, or this is Chilean Cab, and it comes from all over, whatever. And the fact this is from a specific area and a mm. single vineyard within that specific yeah. area, they're obviously taking the time and the effort to go, that works here. It's yeah. not making Pinot Noir because we need a Pinot Noir in our portfolio. Totally. and Because there's, there's a lot of very entry-level wineries that make delicious, quaffable juice, mm. but they make a Merlot, a Pinot, a Cab, a Sauvignon, yeah. and they, they make all the flavours for, totally. for want of a better phrase. This is this is a standout Pinot Noir and I mm. think it does a really, really good job for for um what it is. And it's great to see something that's not as we've said, you know, tonight we talk about Pinot, we talk about Burgundy, Oregon, California, New Zealand, mm. Australia. Essex. And the only way is Essex. Yeah. The only way. The only way is edit. <laughs> um, um, but I think it's good to see something that's not what you expect. Because when you say chili, you think 
Cab, Pais, yeah. you know, those kind of things. Merlot, big, jammy. We're not allowed to talk about Merlot in a Pinot tasting. Um, so yeah, I think this just shows that there are the main regions that you expect Pinot Noir to, yeah. to grow. And then there's countries where you don't expect, mm. but they have these little pockets that yeah. you've got to delve deep to find them, totally. to find you know where Pinot Noir can really yeah. do well, somewhere you might not expect it. But two um, little hints and tips for finding one of these gems on a, on a wine shelf. There's some, um, there's two very important words here, single vineyard. Now anything that's got single vineyard on means that it's a little bit more to get a cracking wine because a lot of wine is picked from various vineyards in various different warmth um, areas of a region and then they're blended together to get the right balance in the wine. To get the right balance in the wine from one single vineyard is really hard so it means that a lot of care and a lot of effort's gone into it and it's worth a punt. I think that's good. So anyway, Caroline couldn't be with us this evening. No, I'm she's watching playing from, in the Lake District. So I, uh, I am. I am watching she, from the Lake District and I'll, I, hopefully you've seen I'm in the chat in the Lake District. I just couldn't physically be here. But, but she'll be back live next month. Yeah. But anyway, we'll go back to the studio now and see what your favourites were. You're already in the studio. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, th this is fascinating because let, let's be absolutely clear. The, the Macarena um, is an absolutely delicious wine and Caroline is completely right. This is a wine that all three of us actually pick up and drink um, and uh, we, we love it to bits. Uh, I, from my point of view, um, and actually, I think you agree because you, you said this first, but I, will, I was thinking at the same time. Well, so my we point of view has become your point of view. That's right, it has. Okay, great. Because <laughs> I have no opinion of my own. <laughs> well, as you've noticed. that's what we gather here, but you know, <laughs> as long as we know. But what we were expecting from the Southern American New World Pinot Noir was fruit. Lots of great fruit. And when we taste it on its own, you get that in abundance. But compared to these two, it... it it's, it's it's different. It, it's not as fruity as yeah. you would expect, and I think there's a, there's a great point in that about Pinot Noir and value of Pinot Noir and cost of Pinot Noir. Yes, Pinot it's Noir point. is tough to grow. It is. It's thin skinned. It ripens unevenly. You know, I, I, I can't do it like Alex does it in a <laughs> isn't in an opening but scene. Like me copying Paul Giamatti. <laughs> exactly. But what we've got to bear in mind with with a, with a grape like that, you shouldn't be able to get cheap as chips. Pinot Noir. No. You shouldn't. And it, it's a grape that deserves the cost, deserves the value, but it's the line of Pinot Noir runs anywhere from yeah. 12, 15 quid a bottle to 12, 15,000 quid a bottle does, and everything yeah. in between. And so and, much. And extremes beyond that as well, yeah. as well, depending on what you want. So, but, but, but that one is, like, like Caroline said, it's a single vineyard project. So they're bringing in character, they're caring about it. And this is their. They really are quite clear this is their premium project because a lot of what Chile does in Pinot Noir is that supermarket style, supermarket Merlot, and it's nice. That has a lot more than it. So I think we've been a bit unfair putting it directly after two quite high-end mm. wines. But what I want to go after as well is this Santa Macarena is a single... No. No. <laughs> Is a single vineyard project. It is, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> they even so, seem to have an amphitheatre on their side. So you your, saw that. your wine is just a wine of Burgundy from anywhere across the entire it is, thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This is a just a simple a Pinot Noir Appellation Bourgogne Contrôlé. So okay. that means it could come from vineyard sites anywhere that all are over Burgundy. Nice in Bar Burgundy. Yeah. Um, so my wine comes from the Willamette Valley um, in Oregon, but within the Willamette Valley, there's um, they make single vineyard wines, they twill, do. but this comes from a blend of three different vineyards from Stormy Morning, um, Johan's and Molly's Vineyards. Yeah. So we're taking a blend here. This is the only single vineyard wine. It is. So should the single vineyard wine be the best wine? <sighs> you, but you just can't take it on its own, can you? It's, it, there's so many different things and that's why wine's so annoying and complicated and why we love it and hate it in equal measures, you know. Um, it does make it very difficult to know what you're going to get. So, But if you've got a choice between a Santa Macarena blend and a Santa Macarena single vineyard, is one necessarily better than the other? 
Hey. Oh, I'd argue Macarena. no. I'd argue no because again, blending <sighs> gives you options. Um, it, it reduces the character, but it gives you options to make something delicious. And if what you want is delicious rather than a statement of the terroir of that particular vineyard on that particular day, which when you're getting for these really historical sites like the, you know, the, the, you know, the Givry Chamartin Grand Cru vineyards, that particular little side of the vineyard will be very different to the other side and it'll be diff totally different across the road, which is unclassified. So, well, or just Givry. So I'm, I'm thinking we might have to change it up a little bit today. Okay. I think before we vote for our favourite, I think prices. we need to reveal the prices. Yeah, we should. Because it comes, to, it, it comes down to value. Have you already put them into vote for their favourite? Get back. Oh, okay. Go, oh, okay. We started right, let's, it. Oh, let's see if we can undo word. that. Because we're, I'm going to get the... Um, get the prices up. Yeah, let's get the vote. prices up. Okay, prices are up. Because I no. think what we need to look at here... <laughs> so Jamie's spent all the money on this tasting on his wine. But I... <laughs> <laughs> Mine's a little bit more reasonable, but Caroline's is a steal. And trust me, if you drink that wine on its own, it is stellar. It is beautiful. Um, but while people are voting now where they can see the prices, which I think will change things around a bit, I'm going to answer a question that popped up in the chat, which was... Where is the English Pinot Noir? And I mentioned, I think, I shouted out across the room while they were talking about this, Essex. And That's the only way. The only way is Essex. So this wine here is by a little, a tiny winery that's, I mean, I say tiny, it's much bigger than us, of course, but called Gutter and Stars. And it's by a journalist and an all-round lovely guy called Chris Wilson. And... Um, um, this, he's only made 400 bottles of it. It's his first year making wine. Um, he did a vintage out in Napa, I think, with actually with Ben from Flint. And um, this is called Hope is a Good Swimmer, which I believe is a lyric of some sort of probably 1990s uh, song that I don't know. But it, it's in the bottom of a windmill in che uh, Chesterton in Cambridge. So it's literally <laughs> underneath the ground. And that's where they do all of their fermentation, all of their work on blending and you know, filtering and uh, fining. Although I think this is not filtered or fine. I think the whites probably are. But it is fantastic. And it's absolutely delicious. Uh, I really like it. Um, and I'm big up to Chris for producing a, a, a top-notch English Pinot right out of the box. Now, when you compare these side by side, there are some real differences that start coming out. But if you compare it with other English Pinots, I think that's a fantastic example. And I don't think one is better or worse. I know we can all have our preferences, but I think the, the artwork's great, the branding's great, and um, yeah, that it's it, he's setting a high bar for the uh, for the urban winery scene in, here in the UK. So we've got to we've got to hopefully try to find some grapes this year. Well, again, grapes have been decimated this year, and we're in we we are putting our requests out right now to make our own, aren't we? We have grape expectations. Yeah, we've already found out that because of the combination of COVID uh, and a little side order of Brexit, um, the grapes are basically not coming in from Europe this year because the risk that there won't be enough lorry drivers after the harvest to get them here. And that is not ideal if it's going to take... It's one thing if it takes two hours to get to the winery and then you put them in a cold tank to keep them for, for six days. It's another thing is if they're travelling over the land of Europe, unable to refrigerate it because they're waiting in, you know, depots. That's not good for grapes. So we can't, we can't make European grapes this year into wine and we are now looking for English grapes, which are more expensive. And but more also, delicious. Well, they're just different well, flavours, aren't they? Different flavours. Well, it flavors. depends how the winemaker handles them, I'm sure. Oh. No pressure. He's a cheeky monkey, but... Um, um, you, as, as these guys have proven, you can do something that's really cool with, with grapes on this country, and the way he's gone is Essex. And the Crouch Valley down in, in Essex has got some sensational vineyards, really, really genuinely amazing. And they benefit from two things about that, that part of the world. One is the low altitude... And the other is the, uh, the, the, the the dryness of it, like like Altas. So Essex and Norfolk don't get as much rain as the rest of the country. Cornwall's a bit warmer, but it gets rain. Whereas, I hope not too much rain because I'm going there next week. So, um, but yeah, it, it's fascinating to compare these different expressions. And Have uh, we moved on to top wine of the night? Can we? Let's do that. So yeah, let's move on to the wine of the night. Well, should we see where the reds are? Let's, oh, let's pick the reds. 
Where the Reds? So my line is, I think everyone's voted for Caroline because they want to be yeah. their best mate. Are you kidding me? We never show. <laughs> we, we never show the prices again first. Never. That's, never. Why, that's why I went straight to the poll. So just remember. Anyone who voted for Twill Sellers, let me know because I'm going to invite you down to the winery to hang out and drink a bottle with me. For those who voted for Santa Macarena, love you all dearly. You've just got to go to the Lake District to hang out with Caroline. Well, you buy family. some, buy some. Yeah, so um, let, let's let's remind you, there are some absolute crackers for value for money in this one. And we you know, we normally like to push the boundaries a bit in, in the Adventure series and go for the wines that we, we you wouldn't buy a bottle of to try. Like, I wouldn't go and necessarily buy a bottle of Pinot Noir from Oregon. I would. Unless, well, you would, yes. And uh, no, absolutely. But unless I'd tried it first and knew it was one of the better ones. And um, 30, 35 pounds is a, is a good price for that one. It's an excellent quality. I think I prefer the style of mine, but they are both excellent wines. And I think technically yours is probably are the, are better. The, are there votes there so people can see them now? Or is that the one oh, the oh, that's that's my bad. Okay, uh, yeah. uh, prices. Oh, no, that's it. Yeah. There we go. So, yes. Oh, it's a tie. Oh, oh it's changed. It's gone 30, 30, 39 now. Okay, so tie. It's a tie between if, the two of and us. And if you're not in the studio, you lose 10% of the vote. So, me and Alex win. We win. Cheers, Caroline. Cheers. Okay, so let's flick on to wine of the night. Okay, okay. So, all, all that goodness for me, that's, 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 that's crazy, isn't it? Um, I want to see what's in the chat. Um, voted five from Adam. Uh, Michael also for, for Twill. Uh, Twill is excellent. It's, I think it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so interesting to see how the effect of the blending from a wider area on the René Monnier has done. That has made a big impact on, on its sort of its profile. But it gives the ability to have a little bit more richness. It does, than if it just stuck yeah. in one particular but place. It's, I think it's more elegant. And I think it's got that classical Burgundian elegance, which people talk about. People, some people get quite annoyed about elegance as a topic. You know, is, it, is that inherently feminine? I, I don't the know. Gris is destroying the world. Oh, wow. 64%. Holy moly. I'll pick that one. Well, we'll, we'll have to let... Was that, um, was that my a, pick? A good vote for Pinot Blanc, because I think I think that, that was a surprise to me. Like we said, it's a bit of a workhorse. It's a bit, you know... It's something you put in there to bulk up the wine quite often. It's still great quality, but compared to the stars of the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier, it's done to bulk it up a bit. It's certainly in sparkling wines, at least. And when you try us... Oh, so this is an interesting thing. I'd love to do this one day. Sparkling... Base wine. So what do we mean by base wine? We mean the still wine that you make, first of all, to blend together. So you make a dry still wine out of your grapes and then you blend them together and then you add some more sugar and some more yeast, which is normally E118, I think. Um, and that gets put into the bottles to do its fermentation and to make the fizz. And only at the last moment do you turn it upside down effectively over a period of time to get all of the gunk that the yeast has produced into the top. You freeze the neck and you pop it and uh, get rid of this little plug of frozen wine and the nasty stuff, leaving a beautifully clear bottle of wine, which was the technique that Dom Perignon discovered. Um, so those base wines are weird, aren't they? They are. I was lucky enough uh, many years ago to do a base wine tasting with Maya Chandon. So white yeah. Pinot Noir, white Pinot Meunier, yeah. um, and the Chardonnay. And the, the base wines are so sharp. They're like, it's, it's all, almost like, drink them, it's eye-watering. And I, I find it absolutely <laughs> amazing that people yeah. are able to... I couldn't agree more. Taste these wines and turn it into something quite spectacular. Yeah, you're blending, it's really interesting. You're blending potentially, you know, 50, 100, 200 different horrible tasting wines together using nothing but your experience and your taste buds of what that will become after it has had the secondary fermentation to make the bubbles and after you've put in a little bit of sweetness at the end to, to bring that fruit out. And I, 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 I have nothing but respect for those guys. It is, it's crazy. The, I walked around a, a, a sparkling winery and tasted, you know, similar, but in, in, in England. And it was like tasting paint stripper. 
<laughs> There's really not much to recommend any of these individual component wise, and yet their finished product is lovely, absolutely lovely. So, uh, so that's 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 the funny thing about Pinot in this family, and like we said, it includes grapes like Chardonnay, and that when they looked at the genetics, they found that Chardonnay had evolved from Pinot Noir and um, Gamay. That's less surprising than Gamay in yeah. Beaujolais. Gamay. It tastes like a weak Pinot Noir anyway. But, that, Noir but there's so many things that are linked to whatever. We, we, we were tasting a, a yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon earlier and talking about heritage and Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc are the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon yeah. and Cabernet Franc is the parent of Merlot. There's a, there's a lot of links yep. in between things. So there's a lot of things that kind of come together and go from there. Um, but yeah, I think that was the thing about the Pinot family is that compared to any other family of grapes, a, a lot of people think it has a much higher rate of evolution it it evolves faster and it changes in more dramatic ways you don't suddenly find your merlot who has suddenly become a white grape it, it hasn't done that pinot just seems a little unstable a little edgy and and i think that's what makes its magic is that it is so unstable and at one point it can go off in that direction, at one point it can go in that direction and even when the grapes well, grow beautifully nobody else wants any twill so it's going to be mine <laughs> <laughs> Bitter much. So uh, the 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 winner of okay, the, okay, so the winner the, of the, the night. Pinot Grigio not winning. That's not not surprising. Look, it's an excellent Pinot Grigio, and I hope you all agree with that. The reason it was in there was to provide that direct comparison. Absolutely. Um, Pinot so, Blanc. Hopefully, he's found a new great fan there. I bet. I bet <sighs> that's Ian. <laughs> may well be. May well be. So, what's coming up next? What is coming up next? Yeah. So. Next month, we'll just talk about the two the two things that yeah. we're doing. Um, we're going to do a back to school for our discoverers level. So I'm going to talk about physics and gravity flow wineries and history and the oldest wineries yeah, in the world and, and fun stuff like that. It's a tricky topic, but what we want it's to do is to have some fun. It's we a want fun to like go, topic. Let's let's this wine wouldn't appear in here without a really good reason, but it's a really interesting wine, and so. Well, let, let's talk about. And it's going to be a mix and match of wines all over the world. Wines all over then, the world. So, for those of you who are our members really and join us on the adventure series, next month we're going to do the wines of Bordeaux Bordeaux Masterclass. Yes. So that's going to be a yeah. lot of fun. Then going forward to the well, month, so we're going to do whites, we're going to do reds, we're going to do sweets. Sweets. Yes, yeah. we are. There's going to be, and I'm trying to find something that's got a bit of age on it, so we might get a bit yeah. of an old Bordeaux in there. Um, not to be confused with bored ducks That's who true. don't want to go. The... And then the, uh, the next month we are going to play um, Austria for yeah. our discoveries level. And then we're going to do Alpine wines um, yeah. with our friends at Pong Cheese. We are. So we're going to have some little bits and pieces coming out to so talk about the cheeses about and the wines will be paired and, 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 and matched so that you've got some really cool, interesting combinations going on. Absolutely. So, so there'll be, be more, the more details popping up on the website. Yeah. If you're on our uh, on our mailing list, we will get you an email so you know what's going on with that. So that's going to be a little bit of fun. What else is going on? Well, I've got a question for people at home. So Have you? There's, yeah. Uh, Your there's job now, is to answer the no, questions, I know, not no, I give know. the questions. But no, tonight I'm giving a question. Oh, okay. So now that we've turned off the uh, tasting notes, something has appeared behind me which looks a little bit like a Christmas tree. Who can guess what that is and what it's for? Um, and okay, keep it clean, children, keep, keep, it, keep, keep it, it clean. clean. Dan, no, no, you're not answering that one. But yes, you can do that. Um, otherwise, um, we, we've just got to reiterate how, how thankful you are for your patience with dealing like, with things that are just so out of your control, like internet connections and whatnot. But um, it's, been a, it's, it's been a cool opportunity as far as I'm concerned, to to isolate things, to, to, to taste these things, and then to put them next to their companions and see how one grape family can produce something as different as Pinot Grigio to your twill. Like, that's pretty much same, the, the same DNA. They twill be different. If so, you want to leave now, I think that might be a good opportunity, but, but I'm so, still, we're still getting some lovely comments. We are getting some lovely comments, but so me and Alex might be kind of geniuses when it comes to selecting these wines and um i think we allowed caroline to pick the winning wine tonight because we love her all dearly we do because um if we, we had to come back from the lake district we you. wanted to come back from the lake district absolutely <laughs> but if we'd not had her pick the winning wine how would we have been able to do this so good night yeah good night guys have roll credits evening. roll credits When the 
drink, they call me macarena And the boys, they say, que soy buena They all want me, they can't have me So they all come and drink beside me Sip with me, sip with me And if you got, I'll take you home with me Dalla tu cuerpo a la cría macarena Tu cuerpo es brutal a la cría cosa buena Dalla tu cuerpo a la cría macarena Hey, macarena Dalla tu cuerpo a la cría macarena Tu cuerpo es brutal a la cría cosa buena Dalla tu cuerpo a la cría macarena Hey, macarena Dalla tu cuerpo a la que yo me acabo de ti, tu cuerpo es la tarde a la que yo me acabo de ti, tu cuerpo es la tarde a la que yo me acabo de ti, tu cuerpo es la tarde a la que yo me acabo de ti, t